Good morning, our church family and friends. I'm so thankful that you tuned in today. Uh, this message is our last message in the year 2020. Some of you are ready for this year to be over and to get into the new year. Uh, I want to give you a background. Uh, you know, I pray about what we're going to be doing in the upcoming year, what the message should be to get us into the upcoming year, the subject that God really wants us to focus on. Uh, and in our prayer groups, we have prayer on Monday nights. If you would like to join us, we do it online and we also have it in person here in the building. Uh, and so we were praying out very recently. I got a hold of the prayer leader, uh, Miss Han, and was just asking her, like, hey, you know, we were praying the other night and we really hit a vein. And I want to know the subject, you know, what, what were the key points out of it? And we were praying uh, according to this scripture that we're going to be reading in Hebrews 12. Uh, about running a race, letting go of the things that so easily beset us. And we were praying for the leadership that we would not hold on to things that would trip us up, things that would slow us down, that we would let go and run. Uh, two months ago, I was praying about what the new year looked like and what we were supposed to focus on. And I wrote down Hebrews 12, really got that in my heart. And I just kind of let it go. And I'm like, I'll study it later and really get into it. But that's really the direction I feel we need to go for this uh, coming up new year. Uh, and when I was praying on this subject Monday, having to go back and look at what I'm going to focus on in the new year. You know, it, it took me a while to connect all the dots of what we are praying through. And then my wife, Jessie, was telling me that uh, for the new year, what God was really telling her and what she really felt in her heart was no more delays. No more delays. And uh, I wish I could have connected all the dots at that moment, but it wasn't until I started studying for this new year, studying in what God, you know, I wrote down a couple months ago, God was kind of giving me what direction we we're going in. And then we're praying this out on Monday. Then my wife tells me uh, what God has given her. And I did not put it all together till I started studying for this new year. Uh, and I was just like, Jesse, you won't believe I'm here like, you know, of course you will, because it's the way God works. But what you were telling me, what we're getting in prayer, and what I wrote down two months ago for this upcoming new year, all connects together. And of course it does. It's how God works. It's how the Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs us in confirming what it is He gave me two months ago in prayer and by someone else, my lovely, lovely wife. Uh, but I want to get into the subject of prayer. I believe that uh, we're going to get some things done in prayer and then we'll see them manifest in the natural. Uh, and I want, I believe this upcoming year, 2021, is going to be a great year for the church. It is going to be a year of favored. If you haven't listened to the sermons we did on Highly Favored last week, uh, listen to it. Just because, uh, you know, God favors something, God's blessing is on something, does not mean we're not going to face hard times. Uh, I believe 2020 has been a good year for the church, even though it's been a very tough year for the church. Why has it been a good year? I believe we've become more focused. We had to let go of a lot of things and focus uh, very tightly on what God is telling us to do. The church had to let go of a lot of things to run the way we were supposed to in this year that we are closing. And coming into the new year, like Mary was highly favored, but she lost a lot of friends. People didn't believe that uh, God's blessing was upon her. Uh, she felt a lot of sorrow in life. Just because you have the favor of God, just because you have the will of God, just because the blessing of God is on you, doesn't mean that you're not going to face some things. But let me tell you, my friend, when you face them, you can have the absolute confidence, fully persuaded that you will fight the good fight of faith, you'll come out on the other side, and that you will have victory in your life. Good Lord, I feel the presence of God in this place already. If that doesn't get your wood burning, uh, it's wet. Uh, but my friend, the good thing is, just hang around the fire. If your wood's wet, hang around the fire. In a dry out, you will ignite. You will run your race. You will finish it, and you will be able to say, God is 
good. I have I've prepared. I've done everything I know. But when I couldn't do what I know needed to be done, God was there to help me get to the other side. It's only by His grace, His mercy, and His favor. We're going to run our race this year, and we're going to accomplish it. We're going to do what God has called us to do. And whether it's in good times or bad times, we're going to see the favor of God. We're going to see the hand of God, and we're going to see His victory come to pass for us. Oh my goodness. If you're by somebody, just give them a high five. If, you, if you're not, just give me an air high five right now. <laughs> um, hey, rewind it. Give me another one. <laughs> Let's turn to Hebrews chapter uh, 12 and verse 1. Now, like I said, this subject is going to be on prayer, but it's going to be on the prayer of uh, confession this morning. I believe if we don't understand the prayer of confession, we're really not going to be able to stand in different arenas of prayer in our life. We've got to have this down. Let's look at the 12, Hebrews 12, but let's put it in a baseball term. Uh, the prayer of confession is like first base. It is the basic. It's the first thing we get to. We must have this solid on the inside of us today. Uh, and we're going to do that. Let's look at verse 12, or excuse me, chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compressed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, okay, Hebrews 12, what comes before Hebrews 12? This is not a trick question. This is basic, very easy. What comes before 12? What comes before Hebrews 12? Hebrews 11. You got it. Hebrews, Hebrews 11 comes. Now, what is Hebrews 11 all about? It's the Hall of Faith. Not the Hall of Fame, but the Hall of Faith. It goes through and shows us all our uh, forefathers, all those who came before us, the faith they used, uh, and how they got through to the other side using faith. And so, we're talking, they wrap up Hebrews 11, talking about the Hall of Faith, and then we get into saying, Wherefore seeing also compressed about us with so great a cloud of witnesses. What, who are those great cloud of witnesses? It's all those that went before us in faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, it's all of them. It's grandma, grandpa, it's all those who went before us. Maybe it's mom, dad, uh, you know, brother, sister, child, whoever has has gone before us. They are the great cloud of witnesses watching and cheering us on. Somebody asked me, what can they all see? I don't know. I don't know if it's like, you know, you get in the shower and a black bar pops up. I have no idea. Or maybe they just see the glory uh, surrounding us like Adam and Eve uh, in the garden. I'm not sure what all they see, but don't be too concerned. It's all good. Uh, and so, so in this, let, let's jump into it. Let's get into Let's get into prayer here. Uh, so we do have a great cloud of witnesses around us, and we do have uh, a race that is set before us. It is the, the uh, race that we are to run. It is the destiny that God has placed before us, and we're running a race with endurance and with patience, with passion and determination. I, I, we're not, I'm not running this race for a, a participation trophy. That's not what I'm running for. I'm not just out leisurely striving alone, looking around. Now, yeah, I'm going to pace myself so I'm not burned out or burned up uh, very quickly, but I'm going to run and I'm going to run everything with on the inside of me and I'm running this to win a race. I'm not running this just to get, you know, oh, here's your participation trophy. I'm running to win. Look at your neighbor and say, let's run to win. So we're running like a, a marathon and we're running with a goal. We're running with a goal of winning and we can win this race. This is not a race that's rigged against you. People have said life is rigged against you. No, when you give your life to Jesus, it's rigged in your favor. Don't get me wrong. There's people that are trying to trip you up, people that are trying to put weights in front of you. When I say people, there is an enemy and people are not our enemy. You know, I'm not, you know, you know the scripture. I don't have to get into it. But right now, there, there's a race we're running, 
and we are running to win and God has set the race in our favor. And he has put the cross right there in the front. It's what we focus on. Uh, and God nailed our sins and he, he gave us victory by the blood, by stripes we are healed. By the blood we come into covenant with him. He set us up to win this race. He didn't set us up to lose. He set us up to win. Yes, people, and things can try to get you out of whack, get you off of the race, but we're going to run it and we're going to run to win and we are going to win because we are children of God and if he be for us, who can be against us? My goodness, y'all are going to... you. Get me late. I can't get behind. I got to finish this one today so we can get into what we need to. But the only way that we can win this race is to lay aside every weight that so easily besets us. Any sin that so easily besets us. So I have a question for you today. Um, is there a sin in your life that so easily besets you? Is there something? Think about it for a moment. And I have a, you know, if, if you do, you don't have to search real hard. Uh, if you do, it probably came to mind right then and there. Now I have another question for you. Have you ever felt like since you gave your life to Jesus and you got out of sin that you did a cannonball right back into sin at any time? Like you, you lived a while and you jumped right off the diving board, did a cannonball, huge splash, back into sin. Don't raise your hand. I'm not asking you to be like, that's me, especially if you're uh, in company right now. I'm not trying to get you to, you know, whatever. But what I am saying is, have you ever felt like you fell into sin or went back to something or maybe even have dealt with something for years in your life? Now, I want to show you there, there are certain ways that we deal with sin on our own. Uh, that we try to do in our own. And maybe this doesn't resemble you. The reason I came up with these is kind of how, in my past, how I've tried to deal with things that have easily beset me. Let's just say, call it what it is. Sin that has easily beset me, uh, tried to divert me, to get me off path path. And there have been times that I've done something. I'm like, that was so stupid. Why did I do that? That is so absolute dumb. Why? 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 I don't know if that is an old amen or an old me. Maybe that resembles you to some degree. But sometimes when we have this happen, we tend to doubt our own salvation. Well, I'm, I'm, how can I be saved and still be dealing with it? How can I be saved for this many years and still be dealing with this subject? I should have freedom over this subject. Sometimes we, we kick ourselves uh, and we, we get to a place uh, even... Sometimes we even just, you know, we, yeah, we doubt our own salvation. We doubt ourselves. We doubt if we can even be free of this. And then sometimes the second thing I wanted to bring out that we tend to do is we tend to beat ourselves up. You, you know, sometimes we're like, you're so stupid. How could you do that? How could you lose that? You're supposed to be a man or woman of God. You're supposed to have your pimper under control. Uh, you're supposed to, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this story. I remember one time. I got in a fight, right? Uh, and I, I lost my cool. I totally lost my cool. And when it was all done, I just remember being like, good God, what's wrong with me? I am supposed to have my temper in check. Uh, especially not enough to, you know, or at least enough not to throw down with somebody. Uh, and I let my temper get a hold of me and I missed the mark. I absolutely missed the mark. Now, was I living in sin? No. Was I, you know, just walking around busting whoever I wanted to? No. But uh, did I miss the mark? Yes, I did. And I just remember just beating myself up, being like, my God, I should be better than that. I, at this time of my life, as much as I've been in the Word of God, I should not allow that to get to me. I should be better than this. Uh, and so sometimes we tend to doubt ourselves, doubt our salvation, doubt if we could ever get victory over something. And sometimes we just beat ourselves up. Uh, I even had a friend one time tell me, you know, I left the church. You know, somebody got out of the church and started, you know, I backslid, basically. And they said that they just dealt with a problem for so long that they didn't feel they could get free of it. 
And so they felt like a hypocrite. They felt like uh, that, you know, how, how can I come to church? How can, how can I continue to come to church and tell God I love Him, worship the Lord, and keep missing it in something so simple that I just seem to struggle with? And that's the devil. That is the lie of the enemy. That is the defeated one trying to divert you, trying to get you off course. He is defeated, uh, but he's trying to divert us. And he can use a problem or a sin in our life that we've dealt with for so long to try to get us out of the will of God. We will not be diverted. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show is we make sometimes wild resolutions. Lord, I, I'm not going to sin. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to pray this amount of time a day so we feel guilty. So we're going to make resolutions, wild resolutions that uh, we get caught up with and we just get distracted. And just like a lot of people with making resolutions in the new year, some of them are able to keep them, but for the mass majority, they don't. They break them. And so we set ourselves up for failure. Let's not doubt ourselves or doubt our salvation. Let's not get to a place where we're beating ourselves up. And let's not get to a place where we're putting the law back on us, making a law, putting us under more chains and shackles that we can't live up to and set ourselves up for defeat. Huh. So, what you know, what I want to get into is that work is that that all that about works is not the way God's going to deliver us. God has a way, and His way of delivering us from sins that so easily can uh, beset us, that divert us, is called confession. We're going to get into it, uh, and we're going to beat this. You are going to beat this. We're all going to beat any sin that so easily besets us. This is going to be a year of victory. This is going to be a year of focus. This is going to be a year of no more delays. No more delays for you. No more delays for our church of fulfilling the call of God on its life. No more delays. If you felt like you advanced just to get another huge problem, we will not be diverted. We will not be delayed. We will accomplish everything God has called us to do. What can separate us from the plan of God? What can separate us from the will of God? Will armies, will sin, will distraction separate us? Oh no, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Uh, if God be for us, tell me who can be against us. Uh, let's get biblical. I almost feel like that song, uh, uh, we'll just change it. Let's get biblical. <laughs> Maybe you don't think like I do, but I sometimes think in songs. Uh, so, questions. Have you, have you, no reason of hands, but have you ever committed a murder or adultery? I think most of us will say, absolutely not. We have not committed adultery. We have not committed murder. Well, maybe you say, well, I've committed one of those things. I don't need to know which one it was. Uh, but maybe, maybe you say you committed both those things. But anyway, the reason why I want to point this out is because I want to look at the king of con the prayer of confession. And I truly believe that is David, who uh, God says is a man after his own heart. And King David, what did he do? He committed adultery and he also committed murder. And this man is the man that God says was after my own heart. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely. But I want to look at some of the things he did. This is going to be the answer for you. The first thing we need to do is admit it. Admit it. I like this. I don't know. This just came to my head. Admit it and quit it. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminds me of uh, the O.J. Simpson trial. Don't, don't, I don't need any comments on that. If the glove does not fit, you must acquit. And so in this, we need to admit it and quit it. But admit it. The first step is admit it. All right, we need to admit it. Let's look at Psalms 51 and verse 1. If you've got your electronic Bible or your paper Bible, turn there with me. Let's read this together. Psalms 51 and 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of the tender mercies, block Cut out my transgressions, wash me through from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is forever before me. The first step to getting rid of weights that so easily beset us is to admit that we 
did wrong. Admit that we made a mistake. Admit it. Um, you know, like I said, I had a friend who said he felt phony, felt like he, he couldn't come to church because he was dealing with sin in his life. And he just got to a place where he's like, I, I, can't, I can't even go to church anymore. I can't even do this because if I truly was doing what God told me, I wouldn't be dealing with this anymore. And so I'm going to help you. If you've dealt with something, we're going to get over it today. Uh, it was nailed to the cross, my friend. Your sins were nailed to the cross. Your sicknesses were nailed to the cross. And we have victory. Don't allow the devil to get you into works to thinking that you have separated yourself or you have been diverted from your plan. People have told me I've done so much that God can't use me. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Do not fall into it. Let's look at 1 John 1 and 9 this uh, today, whether you're uh, listening by the live broadcast or by the rebroadcast here. Let's look this up. Don't put yourself back into shackles. Don't put yourself under the law. Don't do that. No matter how many times you have fallen, no matter how many times you have missed it, do not beat yourself up. Do not put the chains back on you. God has set you free. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we would confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Oh my goodness. And cleanse us, the Bible says, uh, of, from, from all our unrighteousness. Notice that it states here, if we confess. That is, if we confess. This is God's way. It is pointing out His way of dealing with the sins that so easily beset us. All right, so first, we need to admit it. The second thing we need to do is we need to agree with God. We need to agree. We need to admit it, and we need to agree. We need to agree with God. Let's look at Psalms chapter 51 and verse 4. It says, Against thee, uh, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judge." David's speaking here, and what does he say? David is saying, I admit, I agree that I was wrong. You know, it's so interesting. We got a, a, a movement in the world today that's like, oh, nobody's wrong for anything. You're just, you know, it's just DNA. It's just this. It's just that. It's just, you know, people, nothing's wrong. Everything's right. Who are we to say wrong? And I would agree with who are we on our own to come up with what is right and wrong. We must go to the Father. We must go to the Creator. And we must agree at, with Him. We must put ourselves in a agreement with what he says is right and what he says is wrong. We have to agree with him. So yes, we must uh, admit, but we must agree. Uh, David, you know, he, he made very much attention that he agrees with God. He made mistakes, but he agreed that he was wrong. Now, many of us, you know, be like, well, I wouldn't, I've heard, you know, so many excuses of people trying to say why they did what they did, trying to excuse it. Now, there's one thing when you say, well, I'm not trying to excuse anything. I want you to understand where I came from, how this all happened. That's a different story. But uh, there's many people, I mean, look at Adam. Adam said, it, it's the woman you gave me, Lord. And that, that excuse is still being used today. If you had the spouse I had, if you had the boss I had, if you had the day that I had, if you had the stress that I had, if you had the kids that I had, and we tried to make excuses for why we missed the mark, why we let this sin so easily beset us. Uh, but we have to agree that it is wrong. Stop sweeping it under the rug. Stop saying it's not that big of a deal. I, I Oh, this one really, really affects me. I can't stand it. Uh, well, it only affects me. It doesn't affect nobody else. That is a lie. The devil would love to think you that make you think that you're all by yourself, that all you do, it just affects you. It only blesses you. It only curses you. Nobody else... Who cares what else you do in your private life? 
God cares, my friend. He called us to live a life of holiness, to live a life of righteousness, to live a life where we have victory, where we can run our race and not have sin that besets us, that gets us off course. We need to agree with God that when we miss it, that we're wrong. Not making excuses for it, but that we are wrong. Psalms 46. Now, well, let me just say this too before we get... Turn to Psalms 46. We're going to read verse 1. We, we've got to stop justifying sin. Uh, don't, 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 don't justify sin. Don't fall into that trip. But, you know, there's many definitions of sins. I know the definitions of sin. I've looked them up. Uh, but, you know, one of the... I believe you can find this in the Word uh, from Scripture to Scripture to Scripture. One definition of sin is just spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. It's intimate, being intimate with someone or something, being intimate spiritually other than God, other than with God, not having an intimate relationship with Him, violating that covenant with God, being more intimate with the world, with emotions, with whatever it is, than with God. And so let's look at this. Psalms 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Oh, my goodness. And I know if I asked you, what is some of your refuge? What is your refuge? You would all say, you would, you would quote the scripture, my refuge is God, my refuge is God. And I believe that to be true. But sometimes I think as a Christian, we forget this and we believe our refuge is money. And uh, we run to Visa and it is who we trust. Or we run to the ATM and money can buy our way out or you know help us get through things. And can I tell you, sometimes when other people are in trouble, we want to throw money at it. And I understand that. Good Lord, I want to help people just as much as anybody. And sometimes that may be absolutely the answer is finances. But if that's the first thing you run to, then God is not your refuge. And my friend, I would say that that would be a sin. But let's just, let's just look. Let's just keep looking. It, it, it's more than just money. Uh, what else could be your refuge? Drugs, alcohol, uh, People, emotions. I mean, there, there's just so many things that when we're in trouble that we could run to. And anytime we turn to things or others before we turn to God, then God is not our refuge. And if He is not our refuge, He is not our strength. We need to make a determination in our heart. He is the first one we run to. He is our refuge and He is our strength. So what did we say? We said, first of all, we got to admit it. And then second of all, we've got to agree. We've got to agree with God. Um, and the third, my third point, I'm looking at time here. My third point is we got to ask. We've got to ask. Let's Psalms 51. Uh, now, this is right after uh, David is confronted by sin. David is confronted by his sin. And uh, now David begins to ask some things here. So let's look at Psalms 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart. We could just put it this way. God, I'm asking. David is asking. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And he's asking. And renew a right spirit within me. He's asking. Please, God, don't cast me away from thy presence and take not the Holy Spirit from me. He's asking, restore me, un or restore unto me thy joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David, David here, he wrote Psalms 32. And after his sins with Bathsheba here, let's look, uh, Psalms 32. So he's asking God, give me a clean heart. Rid me of this sin. He's recognizing it. He's admitting it. He's agreeing with God. And he is asking, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Give me a clean heart. Give me, let the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of freedom pour into my life. 
Take it not away from me, God, but pour. May I have an uncallous heart, an uncallous spirit toward your spirit. May I be led, guided, and directed by you. Holy Spirit, surround me, guide me, direct me, convict me. May my heart be clean before you. Oh, my goodness. Ah. Now, David wrote, like I said, Psalms 32, but let's look. And we said he, he's dealt with his sin has smacked him right in the face. He's come face to face with it. And this is 32 and verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. The moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. But look, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquities have I not hid. I say I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgiveth the iniquities of my sin. Selah. This is a beautiful but simple truth here. God forgives us when we ask. God forgives us when we ask. When we don't confess our sin, David tells us that it, it pushes us away from God. When we don't confess our sins before the Lord, it pushes us, it puts a wedge, it diverts us from our plan, but it puts something in between us and God. David is acknowledging that when he hid his sins, his life started going downhill, off track. But when he confessed it, God forgave him. Don't stop asking for forgiveness. He's already paid for it. Just ask. And I understand you may feel like, well, God's getting tired of me asking for the same thing over and over and over and over again. Do not believe the lies of the enemy. You may be getting tired of hearing yourself say the same thing over and over again, but God has paid for your sins upon the cross. You will be set free. You, where I'm giving you biblical things to do that is going to set you free free no matter how long you've dealt with this we're going to be set free just say that out loud i'm going to be set free god has already paid the price for you to be set free yes we admit it yes we agree yes we ask and then my fourth point here is we accept all right psalms 51 look at verse 16 for thou desire not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delighteth not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Now, what is David saying here? What is David saying? David is saying, God, if you want you want a sacrifice for my sin, I will go out and slaughter an animal. I will make a sacrifice for my sin. But he's saying, it's that's not what you desire. You desire my spirit to be open to you, that my heart would be open to you, that I would follow your ways. God, I will give you me. I will give you everything that I am. I accept your will, your word, you, Father, number one in our lives. I'm going to tell you, one of the things we must get to is we must avoid with everything in us the fleshly desire uh, to doubt our salvation. We must uh, get rid of the fleshly desire to beat ourselves up. Sometimes we feel better after we beat ourselves up. I know it sounds crazy, but after we give ourselves a good lashing and sometimes maybe depending on what we did, hold it against ourselves for so long, two, three, four weeks, a month, two months, three months, we're holding it against us. We're, we're just despicable. It's absolutely disgust us. We, you know, it, we're, we, we just hold on to it for so long. Sometimes we feel like we punished ourselves enough. We, we're over it. Uh, don't do that. And don't get to a place where we make wild resolutions or put ourselves under the law. 
make a law up to hold us and put more shackles on us. Avoid those fleshly desires. It may have been something you've done in your past, and if you have done it, get rid of it. Recognize, don't allow that to take place in your life. What we must do is follow biblical examples. You know, let's get biblical. <laughs> let's get biblical. Uh, we got to admit it, quit it. Uh, we got to agree. We got to ask. And we have to accept. Psalms 51 and 16, we're not going to give a sacrifice. That's not what God's after. He wants us to come broken heart, broken spirit, open. What I mean by that is being led by His Spirit, not our will, but His will to be done. Not what we think we should do, but what we know biblically we need to do. What God, you know, what David is saying here, what God is saying through David is that we will admit it, we will agree with you, Father. Jesus, you know, he, he was serious about our sin, so serious that he paid the price for our sins. Uh, you know, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We understand that he nailed our sins to the cross and Jesus has set us free from sin. He pray, paid the price for forgiveness. He did not only forgive you, but he forgave you on the cross. He did it on the cross. But what else did he take on the cross? He took your shame on the cross. Don't allow shame to hold you back from the presence of God. Let's believe His word that when we confess, when we agree with Him, when we do these steps, God is faithful to forgive us. He doesn't hold it against us. We don't have to do things in the flesh. We don't have to do things in the natural. We have to agree. We have to, we, we've admitted it. We agree. Uh, we have asked. We've already done that. And we accept what He says, not the way we feel, not our emotions, not our thoughts, but we, like the forefathers that have gone before us, a cloud of witness that encamps about us, with faith they went on and did it. We're going to have to go in faith knowing God has forgiven us and God is holding nothing against us. We're going to live a life of victory. We're not going to stop confessing. We're not going to stop confessing our faith. Uh, confessing scripture. We're not going to stop confessing our faults. We're not going to stop any of this. We're going to continue to do what God has called us to do. We're going to do it the way God has called us to do it. We're not going to make crazy resolutions. We're not going to do any of this. We're going to agree with God that we are forgiven. Just say out loud right now, I have confessed and I am forgiven. God has forgiven you, my friends. So let's not let it hold against us anymore. Let's not let it be something that rips us to shred. Let's not let it let's not let these little things that so easily beset us beset us anymore. The enemy is a diverter. He's defeated, but he will try to divert us from the plan of God. Don't allow him to use anything to divert you. Let's agree with God. Let's let's uh, accept the word as the final authority, and it overrides how we feel, how we think, how anything about us, we know that we are forgiven. I want you to know today that when you confess, you are forgiven. God has forgiven you. Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now, every one of us, right now, right where you are. Father, right now we come before you. And if you, you are dealing with any sin that so easily besets you, just think right now, right where you are, Maybe your eyes are closed. If that's what you need to do to feel like you're in the presence of God or it helps you, whatever it is. Maybe you get up and walk. Sometimes when I'm thinking and praying, I got to get up and walk. If that's you, get up and walk right now. Do whatever it is you need to do. But let's begin to commune with God right where we are and think maybe about what it, what it is that you have going back to. What is it that so easily besets you? I'm not saying you're living in sin. I'm not saying that whatever, but we've, we've missed the mark. We didn't hit it 100%. Whatever has caused us, that easily besets us. Whatever it is, think about it right now. Think about it right now. Maybe, maybe it's a couple things. But let's think about it. And I want you to begin to confess. To confess to God. That we would, that we would admit it. That we would agree with God. That we would ask God to forgive us. And that we would accept His forgiveness.
Father, right now, whether it's lust, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's lying, we confess to you right now, Father, fear, fear has beset us. Fear has gripped us. and We will not allow it to hold on to us. And we will stop justifying it. And we will call it what it is. Father, if we haven't honored our spouse, if we haven't lived in our marriage like you've called us to live, whatever it is that is so easily beset us, we confess it right now. And we ask for your forgiveness and we accept it, Father. That is all of this. Every bit of it. Every bit of it was nailed to the cross. And Father, the shame, all of it, was taken from us. And we thank you right now that Jesus redeemed us. He made us righteous. And He has restored our relationship with you and with each other. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, if you've said that prayer and it, this message blessed you, get a hold of us. Let us know. I love reading your emails. Thank you so much for e emailing us. I have read a couple this week that just really blessed my socks off. And uh, what God is showing you and telling you, I am just so thankful. But the first step is getting our lives right where it needs to be. And it involves confessing. Confessing, yes, our sin, but confessing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says that if we can believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God and we confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. That's the first step of coming into the kingdom of God. If you've never done that, I want you to do it today. If you have done that, and let's say maybe you like the prodigal son, you lived outside of the family. Well, today is the day to come home. The prodigal son came home and who did he experience? The running father. The father ran to him, embraced him. Today, the father wants to embrace you. It's a simple prayer, just like confession, right? Just simple, so simple. We're, it's going to be so short. This prayer is going to be super short. Why? Because it doesn't have to be some drawn out thing. I love it if you feel it, but you don't even have to feel anything. We have to have faith. We have to believe that God heard us and that when we pray. And how do we have this faith? It's in His Word. It says He hears when we pray. According to His will, He hears us. So today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you've never confessed Jesus as your Savior, you're outside the family of God, and you want to come home, I want you to pray this with me. I believe, according to God's Word, that Jesus is the Son of God. I have believed in my heart, and I've confessed with my mouth. And I know today that I'm saved. That's it, my friend. Can it really be that simple? Can it really be that easy? Absolutely. Eternal life is not a, a place to achieve. It's not something we achieve. It's a gift we receive. All you have to do is like the Word said, one of the points, we just have to accept it. We have to see what God says and accept it as truth. You do that today, my friend, and you are in the family of God. If you've said any of those prayers, if this message blessed you, if you have a prayer request, get a hold of us. If you would like to meet at our church in person, if you're in southern Wisconsin and you would say, hey, I want to make my, our church my church, we would love for you to do that. I believe God wants to get the Word of God on the inside of you and God will put His super on your natural and you will be, not might be, but you will be a mighty force for the Lord. Uh, if you'd like to meet with us in person, our church is a non-denominational church here in Madison, Wisconsin. So if you're in lower Wisconsin, you want to come see us, get a hold of us. We'll give you all the information that you need to know about coming and seeing us, meeting with us in person. If you can't meet with us in person, you live far away, please continue to meet with us online, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, or on the website, you know, meet with us. I love to see that you're with us. My friend, thank you so much. I appreciate all that you do. I appreciate you praying for the church. And I'm telling you, this year, we're going to have a year of 
No more diversions. No more getting off. Nothing setting us back. We're going to push through, do God's will, and we will fulfill everything He's called us to do. Thank you again so much for joining us. Whether I see you online or in person, we'll see you next week.